Let's pray as we come to our time in God's word. Lord, today would you continue to reveal yourself to us through this thing called foolishness, the preaching of your word. Uh, by the proclamation of your gospel, you would show us all the more who we are before you, who you are over us, and who you make us to be in you. Lord, through your Bible, would you teach us today? Would you convict us? And would you continue this great work of transformation that you began in our hearts when you justified us through faith in you? We bless your name, Jesus. Amen. We've heard through our Advent season this gospel announcement of Christmas, the angels who said to the shepherds, don't be afraid, but I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all people today in the city of David. A Savior was born to you who is the Messiah, the Lord. This is why we can have a Merry Christmas today. That's the gospel announcement of Christmas. Jesus was born one day in history. The year is largely agreed upon, and the fact of his existence in the time-space dimension of our history is irrefutable. And the meaning of his life, his mission, his person, these are the reasons that we as Christians, we take this day to reflect upon the true significance of the Messiah, of his incarnation, of this Jesus who is the ultimate gift to us from God the Father. Christmas is really squarely about the miracle of how God the eternal Son took on human existence in the most incredible birth ever recorded in history in order to become God's tabernacle among us, Emmanuel, who didn't just merely represent God to us, but who was and is God, and who walked among us, who came to die for us, and who rose from the grave, and who now reigns over us. We all know Christmas is all about gifts. It's about God's gift to humanity, God gifted his one and only son, Jesus, who is himself God. And Jesus came to lavish upon us his gifts for all those who believe in him, gifts of his peace, gifts of his forever joy, gifts of hope, and the amazing gift of a whole new life, a life that is lived for God and by God and with God. This Advent, we've been looking at three basic questions about all of this. The first is really, what child is this? Who is that baby that was born in the manger on what we call Christmas? We said from God's Word, what God's Word says. He is the everlasting Father. He is our wonderful Counselor. He is very mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Alpha and the Omega, Jesus who saves people from their sins. And we ask the second question, well, how could this be? How could it be that God could become human? Or better said, how could he take on humanity to his divinity? We said Jesus of Nazareth was born in Bethlehem of Judea, very man, just like us in all ways except for sin. He had a completely human nature as well as a completely divine nature. This is Jesus, God the Son who has always existed, very God who created the world and created you and created me, the same God, the second person of the Trinity, and he clothed himself in flesh, in humanity, in what we call the incarnation. He was very human. And he never stopped being very really the one true God. Then the last question we explored is, well, why did he have to do any of that? Why did he have to come to earth? 
when we looked at dozens of reasons why Jesus was born. And we concluded that the great miracle of all this is the fact that he didn't have to come, and yet he did. He came to do what we most desperately needed and what we were most hopelessly unable to do for ourselves. He came to save us, as his name says, from our sins. And so today, we're called to just go a touch deeper into that great question of why by returning to John chapter 3, what we've heard read today, and trying to see if we can also keep in mind what we just heard from Romans 3, 19 through 26. And you can sum it up like this. Jesus the Christ, he was birthed in order that we might be rebirthed into a whole new life lived with for God. It's a life lived by, with God and for God. God the Son was born into the world that you and I might be reborn. He was birthed that we could be rebirthed so that we could live with him now and we can live with him forever. Well, let's open our Bibles, if you will, to John chapter 3. We'll go back. If you want to use the Pew Bible with me, it's on page 887. And as always, if you need a Bible, you can take one of those with you. If you follow along on page 887, we'll look closely into this episode that happened in the life of our Savior after he had grown in stature and wisdom. This is years after the manger and the shepherds of Christmas, and it takes place at night. Throughout the book of John, this gospel, there's a sort of question that the gospel writer is posing again and again throughout the entire gospel. It's as if Jesus Christ is on trial and John is writing this, so he says that we will believe in Jesus. But surrounding all of this gospel is the question is, who exactly is this Jesus? Who is he? And again and again, John is showing who he is throughout the gospel. And as John poses that question to his readers, who exactly is Jesus? He has another motivating question. When you know who this Jesus is, when you know who he really is, what will you do with him? How will you respond to him? And throughout the gospel, we see people responding in faith and other people responding in disbelief. Well, here in John 3, we come across a man who is wondering just that question. Who exactly is this guy Jesus? Who is he and what's he about? This man has questions for Jesus. He has questions about Jesus. And how he answers how he gets answered by Jesus totally blows his mind. This man comes with questions to Jesus, but Jesus has sharp questions back for this man. He's coming to ask Jesus, who exactly are you? And Jesus is asking back, who exactly are you? And what's at the heart of this conversation is really the amazing reason that Jesus has come into the world, he, to give us a new birth. I don't know, you might take the whole phrase born again for granted. You might have heard that so many times in church growing up. You might have not known what it's like not to be born again. You've been a Christian for so much of your life. Some of you, though, might be still wondering, what does that exactly mean, born again? People talk about, are you a born again Christian? As if there's another kind. But that question, born again, what does it mean? Well. The beautiful thing that as we come across in John 3 is John the gospel writer is focusing his lens on something very amazing because here's a man, Nicodemus, who's hearing that phrase for the first time in his life, born again. So we have a unique chance to understand that. We'll find out about it really in three steps or three movements is really what is this new birth that Jesus came to give us? What does it mean? What is it? Why do we need it? Why do you need it? And then how do we receive it? How do we receive it for ourselves? How do we help other people receive this gift of a rebirth? What is it? Why do we need it? How do we get it? Very straightforward. So let's just look line by line this morning at these 15 verses and 
to do that properly, of course, we always need context. And our context comes just a few verses before this in chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, and it goes like this. Now when he, that's Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Then we go to John 3, and we get the contrast. Now, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. That word now in the Greek, it could be translated and or but. It's a contrast or connecting. Here's people who saw the signs, and then here's one more. Here's this fellow Nicodemus. Now, here's these people that saw the signs, and Jesus saw in their heart, but here's this man, Nicodemus. He sees the signs. Is he going to be any different than them? Jesus saw through their hearts, and he sees through this man. This Nicodemus, it says, is a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He's a member of the religious elite. He's a master professor of Israel. He's in the ruling body, the Sanhedrin of Israel. He's an esteemed guy, a very learned man. He's a noble sort of fellow. He's not an immoral guy. He's not a pagan. He's not a fool. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, very interestingly, this Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. We know rabbis studied long through the day, so maybe he just finished his studies, or he figured Jesus was busy until this time. Or just maybe he didn't want his co-workers to find out where he was meeting with this man named Jesus. Interestingly also is that he tried to come to Jesus under this cloak of darkness, so often in John's gospel, the theme of darkness points to a moral darkness, either a spiritual darkness or an ignorance. It's beautifully ironic that in this cover of darkness, this man, Nicodemus, comes to visit Jesus, who is the light of the world. And we see that he's respectful. He calls Jesus rabbi, even though he knows that Jesus has no formal rabbinic education, but Jesus taught with such authority and such supreme knowledge that this teacher of Israel, this esteemed teacher, recognizes that Jesus is really the teacher of teachers. Rabbi, he says, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. This rabbi, Nicodemus, he knows Jesus is empowered by God, but he doesn't know what it all means. The teachings, the signs, the wonders, the knowledge. There's something about Jesus that's drawing Nicodemus, and it's making him wonder if Jesus is somebody in particular, someone that the whole world has been waiting on, and someone for whom Israel has been desperately expecting the Messiah. And then look how John records this. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John records that Jesus answered him. But what was the question exactly? Nicodemus didn't ask any questions, did he? Not formally. He said, we know you must be a teacher from God. But the implied question is this, who are you? Who are you then? What do all these signs that we see, what do they mean? We know you're a teacher from God, but are you something more? Are you another prophet? Are you the Messiah? And remember what John just told us at the end of chapter 2, what we read for the context, Jesus sees through people. He knows what's in their heart. Now Nicodemus asserts that he sees something. He says, Rabbi, teacher, we see these things. We discern these things about you. We know these things about you. 
But Jesus is looking into this man's heart, and he knows him and his questions. He sees something about Jesus in the miracles, and Jesus answers, amen, amen. That's what truly, truly means. He says, amen, amen. No one actually sees me or sees what I'm doing. It says, amen, amen. No one can see the saving reign of God at all, including these signs that are pointing to the kingdom, unless you're born again. When Jesus says that again, truly, truly, he's saying, assuredly. Jesus is always saying important things. He's Jesus. But when he says, truly, truly, it's like, hey, you really need to listen to this. This is critical. And he says, truly, truly, You see the signs, but unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You see the signs, but they're all pointing to this very amazing, very big reality. God, the king of that kingdom, is standing right in front of you, and he's revealing and he's displaying the kingdom before you, before your very eyes, and he's making a way for you to come into that kingdom. But what Nicodemus is asking is really, Jesus, do you fit the bill? Should I give you my time? Should I give you my devotion? Or should I look for another? Are you the one? Are you the guy? Do you fit the bill? And Jesus is answering him by turning it around and saying, you don't fit the bill. He's saying, are you the one to come to save us? And he's saying, you don't even really know what it means to be saved. Jesus turns it around on old Nick to say, Dear Rabbi, you don't fit the bill. You need to be reborn. You see signs, but the signs point to the king and his kingdom. You think you see, but you're still blind. John uses the Greek word to capture what Jesus is saying, anothen, which is intentionally a little bit vague or obscure, because it can mean two things. It can mean above or again. Jesus says, you cannot see the kingdom unless you are born again, or unless you're born from above. And just to pause there for the briefest moment, because it's a very important term as you study your Bible, is this phrase, the kingdom of God. It's important It refers to something much grander, something more expansive than just paradise or heaven. It means the reign of God where he rules supreme. And for a first century Jew like Nicodemus, when Jesus says, see the kingdom of God, he would have understood a particular thing. He would have understood that means the Jewish people are now participating in the kingdom at the end of the age, where there is eternal life and resurrected life, where those things would be experienced by real people. They knew such a kingdom would be ruled over by a son of David. That's in Isaiah 9, which we've been reading. It's in Zechariah chapter 9, 9 and 10. They knew that this kingdom would also be ruled by the Lord's servant. We find that in Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 49. And they knew that this kingdom would be ruled by the Lord himself. That's also in Isaiah 9 and 33 and Zechariah 14, 9. In short, Jews like Nicodemus knew that the coming ruler of this kingdom, whenever it would come on earth, that ruler would be both identified as God and differentiated from God. In other words, exactly who Jesus is, one who was with the Father and one who is fully God, one who is God and who is with God. And the king here, Jesus, is saying, that's me. And that kingdom has come in part now because the king is standing on the earth. And the king is talking about his kingdom. He's letting Nicodemus know that he surely is the Messiah and his kingdom has begun on earth as it is in heaven. 
In the Gospels, we see this kingdom is amazingly not only future, but it's present. It's now and later. The kingdom has already begun to show itself in the works of Jesus, in the message of Jesus, in the signs and wonders of Jesus, in the person of Jesus. The kingdom is here because the king is here. And all the miracles Jesus does show God's kingdom breaking forth into the kingdom of evil and the kingdom of this world, restoring things, healing things, feeding people, restructuring their eyes, bringing their legs back to work, and bringing them to salvation. In Jesus the Christ, God's sovereign reign of salvation and his transformation of the world, it has already begun. Later in the famous verse of John 3.16, Jesus tells us that his kingdom has come in the way that Nicodemus expected. The Jews said, when that kingdom comes, there will be resurrection life, there will be eternal life. And what does Jesus say in John 3.16? If you believe in me, you have it now, eternal life. So what is this new birth? Jesus tells this respected Pharisee that he must be born again or born from above. Nicodemus takes it to mean again, which is where his confusion comes from. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus seems to be getting a little upset. He's no fool. Does he really think that Jesus is speaking literally that he needs to crawl back into his mother's womb? He knows that that can't be what's happening here. But Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He answers his question there in a similar way that he did in verse 3. And there are parallels meant in Hebrew thought to contrast and add depth to each other. Look at verse 3 and this verse 6 together. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit. To be born again, he's connecting in a parallel to be born of water and the Spirit. To be born from above, to be born from God, to be rebirth means there's something God does with water and the Spirit. And he says, unless God does that, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he accents that you cannot even enter the kingdom of God. This new birth, this rebirth is essential for one's soul before we can even see the kingdom of God, before we can even enter the kingdom of God. What Jesus is saying is unless one's heart is rebirthed or regenerated, that means given new life, then they cannot even begin to understand who Jesus is, and they cannot choose Jesus, and they cannot enter into his kingdom. The new birth doesn't happen after someone gets into heaven or is admitted into the kingdom. The way Jesus phrases it is this new birth is the prerequisite. It's the before thing that has to happen before becoming a child of God, before becoming a member of his kingdom. You see, what's really so damaged in the human soul since we fell, our ancestors sinned in the Garden of Eden, and we have collectively kept on sinning. What's damaged in the fall is our will to desire God. We still have free will, but the will that has been so severely crushed by our sin is our will to follow God our will to be with God, our desire to worship God, our will to bow our knee to God. This is why the Bible says things very plainly, like no one seeks after God, no, not one. Because there is no human who has a will that says, I want to worship God in their sinful fallen state. It's why the Bible calls us haters of God and enemies of God, 
not just because we do bad stuff, but because in our fallen selves, we don't even and we can't even desire to do good and to worship God. So Jesus says is what we need then is a new heart, a new life. It's so drastic, he says, we need a new you and a new me. This is shocking language. Just think about it for a moment. In rebirth, Jesus is saying that we don't need to have part of us fixed or even parts of us fixed, but we're so damaged that we need a whole regeneration. We need a whole new us because the whole of us is defective. Not just my mind, not just my heart, not just my body, not just my soul, but everything is defective. So the human doesn't need a little patching up. We don't need a little encouragement. We don't need a little inspiration or new thoughts or more teaching. We need regeneration. We need rebirth. We don't just need a revival or a return to God. We need a resurrection of our will to even desire after God and to even return to God. This is not a new teaching in the Bible. In verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? The famed teacher of Israel is kind of flabbergasted here. But Jesus' response tells us that Nicodemus shouldn't be so surprised. He says, Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? As Jesus calls out Nicodemus, this senior professor of the scriptures, he calls him out for not understanding what the scriptures say. That tells me that we need to assume that at least part of this should be discoverable in the Old Testament. That it should be there because he's calling out Nicodemus to say, you read this, why are you surprised? That this new birth is from above, meaning This is only something that God can do and only something that He will ever accomplish for you. And the new birth is from water and the Spirit, meaning a washing and a renewal that happens by God the Holy Spirit. Well, where is this? Well, across the Old Testament, we see that the Holy Spirit or God's Spirit is continually God's principle of life. He is there at the very beginning of creation, creating and organizing life. And then the Old Testament writers looked forward to a time when God's Spirit would be poured out in humankind. That comes from Joel 2.28. It's something we heard Peter stand up say in Acts 2, and he says, that day is here, the day we waited on, when God's Spirit would renew us and fill us resulting in a blessing and in righteousness. Isaiah talks about that in his 35th chapter. And they looked forward to a time that when God's Spirit would come, there would be a total inner renewal that would cleanse God's covenant people from their idolatry, from their disobedience, from their dead wills. In Ezekiel 36, 25-27, this, this word of cleansing by water and by the Spirit, they get combined in one passage. There's water that's cleansing God's people from sin, and there's the Holy Spirit who is birthing new hearts, which allow people to truly, wholly follow God. It says this in verse 25 of Ezekiel 36, then, this is God speaking, I will sprinkle clean water on you. Who will do it? the Lord, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. 
It's no accident that in the very next chapter, Ezekiel 37, that's where you find Ezekiel witnessing to those dry bones, and they're resurrected back by the life-giving Spirit. And the result of such Spirit-led work from above is that these hearts of stone are changed into hearts of flesh, these unresponsive hearts, hearts with a will that is dead to follow God, that's dead in disobedience. They're made alive to actually want to worship God, to follow God, and to put away their little false gods. They're transformed in an outpouring of God's grace. Dead hearts are reborn into living regenerated hearts by the Spirit of God. This is primarily what it means to be born again. God does a work in our hearts, which resurrects our will to love Him. It restores our hearts to worship Him, and it regenerates our lives to follow Him in His ways, to want to do that, and to be able to do that. Well, why do we need this new birth? Jesus answers in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The meaning is that natural birth produces natural results, the human race. But a spiritual rebirth produces spiritual results, something supernatural. Only the Spirit gives birth to spiritual children. The distinction here is not between a lower class of human and a higher class of human. The new birth is not turning over a new leaf or getting a fresh start. It's not rising to a higher human consciousness or reaching human potential. That's what self-help offers. That's what many other religions say is for sale. But what God is talking about is a totally new you a completely transformed and regenerated soul by the grace of God through His Spirit. What Jesus is saying is flesh does not beget spirit. We can't manufacture a new birth. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. We can't work ourselves into it. We can't work ourselves into some kind of dizzying spiritual feeling and say we have an experience with God and that's the new birth. All of that is misleading. To think that we can create this with our own power is as foolish as those guys who tried to build that tower up to the sky so they could be gods. You remember those people? It didn't end very well for them. They ended in confusion. And that's what it's like. Flesh times flesh times flesh equals flesh. We can't make ourselves transcend into the spiritual What it means to be in in the flesh here, to be fleshy, is to be natural. But also that word in the Bible means that we are organized around ourself. We are selfish. We are self-centered. We exist for our own power. And apart from the work of God, the renewed presence and power of God, flesh will just stay flesh, dead in sin, locked into its own will, and natural. But we, these fleshy creatures, we can never earn or deserve our way into God's kingdom. But again, we need to hear that repeated a few times like I have because that is contrary to the human heart and to the logic of the world's religions. The nature of man is to think that we can spiritually evolve If we have enough time, enough energy, enough good works, enough willpower, enough focus, enough determination, we can reach a higher plane. But that will never work. Jesus is saying we need to be reborn of spirit and the water so that our fallen spirit will be renewed. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, this shouldn't be surprising to him of all people. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again, he says in verse 6. 
Nicodemus shouldn't be surprised because Jews of all people knew the distance, the great gulf between man and God. They saw it in their daily life, in the restrictions they had, in the holiness codes, in the construction of the temple and how they were to approach God. They could understand that they were so far apart from God and none of their earthly works were going to get them to God. And Jews of all people should have been aware of God's promise that one day he would give them new hearts, clean lives, and a nature full of the Spirit of God. But without that new heart from God, Nicodemus, just like each of us, is he's not only unable to see the kingdom of God in his present state, but there's something far worse that's going on. Why do we need this rebirth? It's not only to see the kingdom, but it's because without a new birth, we are destined to perish. That's where Jesus starts talking about Moses and the serpents in the desert in verses 14 and 15. Jesus will go on later in verses 16 and 17 and 18 to say that he's not coming to judge the world because the world is already condemned. Jesus didn't come into a neutral world. He was birthed into a world already condemned for its sin. The very nature of this world is that already stands condemned before God. And what we need is a new birth out of that because the default position of humankind, the universal position of mankind, is that we're all perishing in the wilderness of this world. Well, that scene that Jesus is alluding to, that Nicodemus surely understood, it comes from Numbers chapter 21. You'll find it starting in verse 4. And it's about Israel that when they fell into grave sin by rebelling against God, by despising His goodness, by defying His lordship. This is what it says from Numbers 21. This is what that snake thing is about. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. They rebelled, and God judged them. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. Knowing their sin, they looked for somebody to intercede. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. Now Jesus connects the dots for Nicodemus, and he says, your ancestors were perishing in the wilderness because of their rebellion against God. But all mankind is perishing in this world for their rebellion against God. As we heard in Romans today, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned against God by rejecting his lordship, by turning away from worshiping him to worship other things, actually even despising him as they did in the wilderness and speaking against the Lord. And then we all deserve God's punishment for that sin if he is a just God. So why do we need this new birth? Because in ourselves, by our flesh, we can't will ourselves out of that predicament that we're in. We're hopeless not only to stop sinning, but we're helpless to undo this penalty of our existing sins that are against us. This is the news that Nicodemus hears, and this is what is troubling. You can't do this yourself. You can't be born into this. You can't earn it by yourself. And even worse news he hears as Jesus talks about those snakes and about Moses from Numbers, Nicodemus would hear, Even now you are perishing. You are fading away because of your sin unless God does something gracious for you. 
And again, this is shocking to Nicodemus. Here's a guy who is learned in the scriptures, who's a good guy, a noble guy. But he's hearing, even you need to be reborn. Even with your pedigree, even with all your degrees and education, even with how much you know the scriptures and all of your morality and your rule keeping, you have to be born again. It's for all people. Unless one is born again, Jesus says, it's all inclusive, then you will perish. Nicodemus needs, like all of us, all men, all women, all children, he needs God to move in grace and loving kindness to rebirth him into this new life. That's why we need it. Well, how do we get it, the last thing? To experience this new birth and this reality of the kingdom now and forever, it's always an act of God. It's always a miracle. It's always a mystery to which we too have to respond, how can this be, God? How could we ever get saved? How could we ever get delivered? How could we ever undo the curse that is upon us? And Jesus answers us like he did to Nicodemus, it's always by God. It's always by his spirit. It's always an action from above. When Nicodemus asks, how can a man, how can this be, we see the problem. He's asking, what do I need to do to get this new birth? Similar to the way the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what do I need to do to get eternal life? Tell me what I need to do and I'll do it. And Jesus says, you don't need to do anything. You need to let me do it all for you. What you need to do is to believe in Jesus and to receive what he has done for you. Nicodemus is answering back to Jesus, this can't be. Nobody can do this. And Jesus is answering, you're right, nobody can. Man cannot do anything to usher in this new birth. It is from above. It's by God's spirit and nothing else. When the rich young ruler turned away from Jesus, and walked away, Jesus' disciples said, how could this be? Here's a rich guy. Rich people must be blessed by God. He said he did all the moral things. If that guy can't get into heaven, who can? And Jesus says, you're exactly right. Nobody except by God it is possible. Now, this is where I've had some people threaten me, and they say, you know, Kyle, if you talk about that word Calvinism again, I'm leaving the church. And I have to say today on Christmas on an every day, I don't read the Bible with the lens of Calvinism any more than I read it with the lens of being a Baptist or a Nazarene or a premillennial or a postmillennial. I just read what it says. And I got to stack it up to what it says across other parts. And across the Bible, cover to cover, God is a sovereign God who chooses and he acts. Out of all the universes, as far as we know, he chooses one planet to have life as we know it. Out of that entire planet, he chooses one race with which he will commune and make in his image. And out of that one race, when they fall into sin, he chooses one man, Noah, by which he will keep a remnant alive. And from the descendants of Noah, he chooses one man named Abraham, by whom he will make a family. And then from Abraham, he chooses one son, Isaac, and not Ishmael. And then from Isaac, he chooses one son, Jacob, and not Esau. And out of Jacob's 12 children, he chooses one, Judah, through whom the Messiah will come. And from that line, on and on, we could fill the morning talking about his choices. Out of all Jesse's children, he chooses David. Then Solomon all the way to a girl named Mary from the line of David, through whom Jesus Christ will be born. And then Jesus Christ, out of all the people in the world, he chooses 12 disciples. Then when one of them betrays him, he's involved in acts in choosing the replacement. And then he comes to one untimely born named Paul, and he chooses him. And Paul wasn't looking to get reborn. Paul thought he knew what his life was all about, he thought he definitely knew who Jesus was, and he didn't want any part of it. In fact, he wanted to stamp out Christianity. 
But Jesus came and rebirthed his heart to trust in him and to give him faith. That's why on Christmas we have to understand why this is such an amazing gift. It's not only that Jesus paid our price on the cross. It's that he even gave us faith to look upon him and believe in trust that he did that. The great gift is that he has rebirthed us to desire him. And he's put faith in our hearts to trust him. Jesus Christ, if you call him a predestination election person, maybe he's the greatest proponent of it. But he's also the greatest proponent of going and sharing the gospel with dead people. It never stopped him from talking to Nicodemus, did it? He's telling Nicodemus, there's nothing you could do. Nicodemus could say, well, why am I listening to you? And Jesus says, here's why. You need to be born again, and only I can do it. And Christmas, I don't want to bother you too much with that. I know it bothers people, the whole idea of election. But just take Jesus' picture here with you. Did you choose your natural birth to be born into this world? Did you choose to be created into this world? Jesus is connecting to Nicodemus. You have about that much power that you had to birth yourself in the first place to get rebirthed into the kingdom of God. You had nothing to do with bringing yourself life into this world, and it's all about God to bring you new life into this world. That's why we can't boast and why we have to fall on our knees on Christmas especially and thank him for the gift of sending his son and the gift of us to be able to receive that son. And that's what Jesus is saying. He gives us one other picture, something earthly that we can grasp in verse 8. And he makes a play on the word spirit and wind, which in Hebrew and Greek are the same word. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. With all of our technology, humankind can harness the wind, but we can't create the wind, can we? We can't make it blow where we want. We are powerless when it comes to the wind, but we feel its effects. We can't see it, but we know it's there. Whether it's a gentle breeze or a tornado, we know that the wind is moving. Jesus says it's very similar with this rebirth of God. You don't control it. You barely understand it, but you can see clearly the effects when God moves, when God regenerates When this new birth comes from the Spirit or the wind, it's verifiable. His work is undeniable. It's unmistakable. Jesus is saying, you can't control this new birth any more than you can control the wind. But God who makes the wind makes this new birth in you. Well, then how do we get it? If God rebirths our heart, if he gives us faith to believe in him, how do we get it? Jesus says to look up at him. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of God be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus is talking about himself being lifted up on the cross. He says when he is lifted up on the cross, all men will be drawn to him. They will see him for who he most truly is, God who came to die for them. The purpose of Jesus being lifted up on the cross is made clear that as he pays for our sins against God, as he removes the penalty of our sins against God, everyone who will look upon him and believe in him may have eternal life. Everyone that the Lord has rebirthed, everyone the Lord has given eyes to see, he draws them to look upon Jesus on the cross taking our sin and our guilt and our shame upon him. And he says, if you will believe, if you will trust in him, you will be entered into the kingdom of God. You've been given eyes to see him. You've given a heart to follow him. Trust him, receive him. You think about that picture that Jesus gave in the desert, that the act that was going to save these Israelites from these serpents is to look upon 
this serpent. For many of them, there was complete disconnect. No, I need medicine. I need something else. What do you mean, look at that thing? But God says, this is what I have given you. This is the means of salvation. Look upon that or you will perish. It's an act of faith. He says, I've given you the sign. I've given you the message. I've given you the eyes to see. Now look upon. This is what God has provided for their salvation. And what were they supposed to look upon? The very thing that was killing them. He says, look. Look at what's killing you. Look what's lifted up, and then I'll heal you. What is Jesus telling us? When he is lifted on the cross, what are we looking upon? We're looking upon the Son of God, but what's all over God the Son on that cross? What's killing us? Your sin and my sin and the sins of the world. And God says, look, look at my Son taking what is killing you and believe in him that he is taking it. And if you will not look upon him, if you will not put your trust in him, you will perish in this wilderness because there is no one else coming to take away your sin. There's other people that can enlighten you or inspire you. They can make you rich. They can make you healthy. There's only one who can deal with your sin. And he died on that cross. And that's why he was born on Christmas Day is to come to die that we could be rebirthed when we look upon him. People want to say, couldn't we just do something for God? Couldn't we just win his favor? God says, no, look up. People say, can't there be another way to get to God? Can't there be another way to deal with my sin? And God says, no, look up. All you need to do is to look upon him. And Jesus is very different than that snake. The snake was a symbol Later on, they had to crush that snake and throw it away because people started worshiping it. In that snake was not life. Life is in God, and he healed them. But what Jesus says is, whoever believes in him may have eternal life because actually in Jesus is life. That's the clearest answer to Nicodemus' question. How can this happen? Jesus is saying, I'm not merely a way to get life. I am life itself. And when you look upon me, when you believe in me, you will enter the kingdom of God with eternal life. If God's calling you to believe in him, if he's giving you a heart to see him, receive that king and that gift of salvation. And if God has already given you faith and you've looked upon Jesus and he has saved you, and we should rejoice this day because you've received the greatest gift ever, eternal life with God and for God and by God. You know, those who looked up to that bronze snake, they received a longer mortal life, but then later they would die. But Jesus says all of us who look upon him will receive eternal life now, that we may perish in this life and we will get sick and we will die but there is a resurrection coming when we will live with God for eternity. Again, I want to remind you of what is happening in the here and now and the forevermore. Jesus the Christ, he was birthed for this reason, in order that we might be rebirthed into a whole new life, lived with, for God, with God and for God and by God. That happens right now, and it goes on for eternity. I want to say this very simply at the end, too. Jesus Christ did not enter the world once and for all. He is again coming back. And one way to really think about why did Jesus come at Christmas, why was he birthed in the first place, a very simple answer to that and a very deep answer to that is this. He came the first time to get us all ready for the second time. He came to make sure that we have a life worthy of, by his righteousness over us, that when he comes again, we were able to stand before him and greet him. And so what we do now until his second advent is we wait, but not idly. We wait living a life worthy of God before him, worshiping him, rejoicing in him, thanking him, and telling the world about him. 
There's many people that we're surrounded with. Some of them are smarter than Nicodemus. Some of them not so much. But they all need the same thing. And it realizes to me that I am powerless to give them a new birth, but I can pray for them. And I can ask God, God, in your mercy, would you move in their heart to rebirth them and regenerate them? I want my brother to believe in you. I want my mother to believe in you. I want my good friends to believe in you. Would you do something in their heart to rebirth them? Let's pray for that right now. Lord Jesus, on this Christmas day, we ask for the gift of gifts, Lord, that you would rebirth people that we know in our lives that we love, people that we work with, people that we serve with, people that we go to school with, our neighbors. Lord, that you would help us share the gospel with them and in this profound mystery in telling them the truth that you would activate their hearts, Lord God, that you would regenerate them, that they would be able to believe in you. You give them eyes to see you and hearts to receive you and that they too, Lord God, would look upon you and receive eternal life. We ask that gift, Lord, for the people that we love. And Lord, today we rejoice that by an amazing mystery, by grace alone, you have given us faith to trust in you alone as our Savior. Lord, for that is it's beyond thanks that we can give if we had a thousand more days here. We bless your name, Lord Jesus, for saving us, for regenerating us, and we look forward to the day that you do come back and that we can stand with you face to face in this life evermore. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen.